Welcome everyone to day two of COSI 2021 conference online. We have uh, the discussion panel trying to uh, debate issues about restarting the tourism, hospitality and events industry. We are really privileged to have a huge, I would say, panel of industry experts representing a variety of the tourism sectors that we represent. We have speakers representing events and festivals, tour operators, the hotel sector, the travel industry, intermediaries online and offline. It's my pleasure, uh, Professor Mariana Sigala from the University of South Australia, along with my colleague, Professor Fevzio Cumus from the University of Central Florida to be the chairs of the session. Uh, the panel basically aims to investigate what has happened in our sectors, what are the current realities and market context that companies operate, and what's the future? How can they restart? So by no further ado, because time is limited, I will give the floor to our first speaker and I, we will be announcing the name of speakers as we go. Uh, we will do the discussion uh, with the questions we have to them first. And after we finish, we will open the floor for questions from everyone. So our first speaker is Jackie Yu. He is actually uh, the co-leader of travel and tourism practice in Asia for McKenzie Company. And it's our pleasure to hear his views about the restart of the tourism economy, particularly from the Chinese experience. Thank you for doing it, Zaki. Thank you, Mariana. Yeah, maybe let me share um, my screen and to start the discussion. Yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jackie Yu. Uh, I'm an associate partner uh, from McKinsey & Company and I lead our tourism practice uh, in Asia. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me to share some of our latest uh, research insight uh, about the sector. Um, so to start with, uh, so COVID-19 is uh, definitely the first and foremost a global uh, humanitarian challenge. So the sharing today is meant to help our senior leaders to understand uh, the situation and then how it might unfold and take steps to protect their employees, customers, supply chains, and financial results. Um, so today I'll cover two topics in a very short uh, limit of time. Uh, one is uh, about the travel and tourism global macro trends. And secondly, I also want to share some of the latest uh, survey result insight uh, from the latest learning uh, in China. So to start with, uh, from our very latest and recent uh, forecast uh, on the top 10 markets by tourism uh, expenditure uh, globally, we see that the earliest uh, uh, recovery can come in uh, 2022 uh, for some of the leaders, say for example, like China, uh, uh, Germany, etc. Uh, but then some of the uh, uh, markets uh, can recover as late as 2025 or 2026. And the cumulative change uh, until 2025 can vary from like 15% uh, to 35%. And this is just a snapshot. So we actually ask uh, close to 2,000 global executives about what would be the most likely scenario in terms of recovery uh, going forward. Right? So uh, we try to think about these with the framework uh, from two dimensions. Uh, on the y-axis, you can see, is about the effectiveness of the virus control. And then on the x axis is more about the effectiveness of the economic policy response. Uh, and as you can see here, um, most of the global executives would think the A1 scenario, meaning it's like a medium uh, uh, effective uh, response on virus and also a, uh, a medium uh, effectiveness uh, of the economic uh, policy response uh, would be people uh, think that would be most likely. And the second takeaway is that if we look at the trend for people's sentiment from like um, uh, Q2 uh, uh, last year to Q4 last year, you can see that people tend to us to think about a more effective virus control, but less effective in terms of economic uh, policy response uh, uh, to boost the uh, economy as a well. whole. And then we take a different look in Asia uh, about the different markets for their patterns in uh, recovery. 
we see that for markets with a large domestic uh, travel uh, expenditure or the travel and, and tourism activities like China and Japan is recovery uh, relatively better. Uh, Australia will be in the middle, but for the markets like Thailand, we rely largely on the inbound uh, travel activities, uh, actually uh, we'll have a slower uh, recovery. And if we take a deeper look in China uh, specifically, so we uh, look at the year round, a full year review of the travel uh, and also the logistic recovery to do the comparison. And uh, we clearly see these would be a two sides of story, right? So on one hand, everything related to domestic, like the domestic hotel line, the domestic uh, rail, the domestic uh, air packs, uh, actually um, are doing uh, uh, relatively well in terms of the, uh, they, they have a more steady and healthy uh, momentum uh, uh, to pick up. But everything that related to international travel, like international air packs and uh, cruise passenger, which in nature is more international travel, are still uh, staying muted. And we see a couple of learnings from the China uh, recovery in terms of the short term, mid term and more longer term. In short term, we see the recovery is supported by domestic luxury and younger generation uh, in terms of the travelers. And in the mid uh, middle term, we see that the latent demand for outbound travel is still very high, right? It's just the feasibility that's stopping people to go to uh, international travel. And also because of the restriction for international travel, we see the substitution effect flowing back to uh, domestically uh, and then nurturing some of the new emerging new themes on like travel in nature, outdoor, or, or even some of the high-end segments on travel retails is recovering uh, quite well domestically. And uh, long term, uh, if we take it uh, to a long term view, we see that digital is definitely a irreversible uh, trend. That digital transformation uh, would be some of the way to go, even amid the crisis or post the crisis. And I just want to show you a couple of uh, interesting uh, analysis that we see uh, for uh, these uh, three uh, different learnings. Uh, in terms of the uh, recovery short term, as you can see here, last year in 2020, the luxury class comparing with the uh, other upper end tier of the uh, hotel sectors are uh, doing uh, slightly better. Right? And this can be uh, explained by the strong leisure demand uh, that support the uh, ultra uh, high end luxury uh, hotel tiers. Uh, and also um, the, the one uh, in the middle, because it's traditionally more a, a mice or the business segment focus uh, suffering uh, more. And also we see some of the emerging uh, new destinations coming up in China as well. Say for example, like Xinjiang, Tibet and Hainan, uh, those will be the destinations with the natural uh, assets uh, will continue to outperform. And on the right hand side, we also see that the younger generation, as you can see in the four uh, 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 iconic uh, holidays in China in 2020, the younger generation, which is the blue bar here, uh, outperform um, uh, the, the situation in 2019. And also among all the other segments, uh, these particular uh, younger generation segments are performing particularly well. And in terms of some of the themes about people would like to do uh, in their next uh, leisure trips, natural landscape tour, beach or resort, family tour and food tour are doing particularly well. And, um, uh, and this is quite consistent in the four rounds of different uh, uh, traveler surveys that we did in 2020. Uh, and uh, one interesting thing to uh, mention is that, say for example, for beach and resort, before the crisis, it ranked around 15 to 20, but during the crisis, we see uh, definitely an uptick uh, in terms of the popularity uh, on this theme of travel. Uh, and one thing really uh, interesting to mention is that in our very latest uh, survey uh, to understand the traveler's behavior and preferences in mid-January, we see that it's the first time that willingness to travel outbound outperformed the willingness to travel domestically. Maybe it's because of the people are uh, getting more comfortable to travel domestically and now are also even thinking about uh, going travel outbound regardless of the uh, restriction of the border. And one final topic about the digital, as we mentioned, uh, uh, so digital transformation is irreversible. Uh, and you can see that uh, here, 
online video streaming or leveraging the KOL, KOC uh, on the uh, online platform or doing some of the short video uh, live broadcasting platform are uh, actually gaining a huge momentum. And we see that uh, for many of the travel players in China, say for example, for OTAs, for hotels, or even uh, attractions or theme parks are getting more uh, federated in terms of adapting uh, the latest uh, technology channel or the media uh, channel to promote and to sell uh, their product. So uh, here's just a sneak peek of some of the interesting uh, um, uh, analysis to set the scene uh, for the discussion today. And happy to uh, connect uh, offline and after, uh, even after the event. So thank you very much for uh, your time today. Uh, so I will pass it back to uh, Mariana. Thank you very much, Jackie, for the very thorough and precise presentation. I'm sure many are interesting to listen to the Chinese market is, since it's very lucrative for everyone. But what about the rest of the world? What is happening? It's our pleasure to have with us Stephen Hood, who is the Senior Vice President of Research for STR, a company that many of you have heard or used. Uh, so let's hear, Stephen, what is your view about global issues? Thank you, Mariana, and uh, it's great to be with you today. Um, I'd like to run through and uh, just show you uh, uh, a quick look at, uh, at some data. My email is on there. So if you'd like to get this data, don't hesitate to uh, shoot me an email. I'll be glad to uh, send this to you. Uh, first, obviously COVID was uh, uh, impactful as far as uh, closed hotels. This just shows during the year of 2020, the, uh, the closures around the world by continent. Uh, most of those is reopened except for Europe uh, in, in lockdown 2.0. Uh, this is full year occupancies for 2020, and you can see they range uh, from 26% to 49%. Pretty bleak numbers, quite honestly, but uh, uh, if you look at that in terms of RevPAR uh, percent change here I'm showing you, we're looking at RevPAR percent change be between 50% down to 72% down. Uh, around the world, and uh, obviously not a not a stellar year by uh, any stretch of the imagination. The interesting thing here now this shows actual occupancy during the entire year from February through January. So you're looking at 12 months of data here for uh, major, you know, for subcontinents including China and U.S. And there you see really the diversity of uh, of what's going on. You see the uh, the the China recovery, and of course, just like Jackie was sharing, everybody's looking at China right now, trying to see what can we learn. Uh, notice China, you know, is is having a lockdown. Uh, as well in January and uh, but other you know look at the other areas in there very diverse in terms of the recovery scenarios. This is looking at the uh, occupancy from a percent change point of view and I'll only show that to, sh to, to show uh, look at China in red during those holidays in September October they were exceeding last year occupancy numbers and then another uh, uh, New Year's was very good you see the uh, the peak there so definitely some bright signs from China and and uh, 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 you know, uh, speaks well for uh, the potential of the future. I wanted to drill down an Asia pack just to show you the diversity of, of some of the major countries in Asia Pacific. Uh, you know, we're all over the map here from uh, uh, Thailand, you know, from a low in Thailand, 20, 25% up to uh, China that we were looking at before. This is interesting, it just shows uh, China, it, it shows the, uh, the major countries in Asia, Last year, January 2020, compared to January 2021, look at the, uh, you know, look at the different stories here among some of these, uh, uh, among the countries that we're uh, uh, looking at here. And just recently, 45%, uh, for last 45 days, occupancy, uh, and, and you're looking at some, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, countries were uh, flat. There were some decreases in area, but interesting, look at some of the increases. Maldives had a great December. It was 80% occupancy. Uh, international travel must have opened up there. New Zealand, Australia still looking good. India in a recovery mode. So lots of different stories here in terms of what's going on recently. Now, of course, we do our uh, forecasting with tourism economics. This is just looking at a you know, general sort of forecast of the world. And, and uh, we're looking at recovery beginning in Q2, 
then Q3, Q4 going on. Now, I'll be sharing uh, Thursday a little bit more. And, and one of the things that I wanted to share in our time on Thursday, I think it's at five o'clock, bright spots. There, these are 38 different bright spots. You know, you could call them green shoots, you know, positive signs. But, you know, the story is complex. There are lots of positive things going on and lots of things to drill down and analyze. So countless number of good stories, countless number of uh, hotels that are actually doing well. You know, you look at a place like Sanya in China, exceeded last year, uh, this year. And, and so, you know, not every hotel is created equal and, and there are a lot of different things to look at. And of course, these are part of the recovery story in as well. Great to be with you. I'll share a little bit more uh, on uh, Thursday and uh, that's a quick update. Thank you, Stephen. That was a nice overview of uh, an insight. Let's go somewhere more local, you to respect for our colleagues here in Australasia and New Zealand. It's our honor to have an input and video from Eoin Loftus. He's the CEO of Conslo Group of Companies, including Majestic Hotels. And he's also the chairman of the Tourism Industry Council of South Australia. He's actually talking about the um, real challenge of companies nowadays, referring to brain drain and how to retain and maintain talent or how to use leadership to, to start. So let's enjoy. Ebony. Hello, my name is Owen Loftus, CEO of Majestic Hotels and Chairman of the Tourism Industry Council of South Australia. Uh, so here to chat about uh, what experiences we've had and learnings from COVID. Firstly, in terms of the impact to our group, Majestic Hotels, we had about an 83% reduction in our income uh, back in April, so that was it at its worst. And now in January, where we are, uh, we find ourselves down about 45%. In terms of employees, very sadly, we had a reduction of about 30% of our workforce, uh, a reduction of about 40 employees, as many of those were unsupported uh, by JobKeeper. Key learnings that we've had, number one is to very closely monitor. Uh, COVID has been a very fast moving thing. Uh, in terms of uh, restrictions and closing borders uh, through to government support, job keeper, job seeker and the like, uh, and job maker. So uh, very closely monitoring those changes. Number two would be being nimble, ready to react and respond appropriately and accordingly because it's so dynamic and ever changing, making sure that you're nimble and that your business can respond to those changes and very quickly. And then three, communication is key right across the business, ensuring everyone is clear on what impact it has to them and what impact it has for our deliverable through to market as well. Changes to how we operate moving forward. A uh, key thing is uh, for us that domestic, um, what people were spending, Australians, uh, on outbound tourism is worth four times greater the value of international tourism coming to Australia. So with our borders shut, our country borders shut to the rest of the world, if we redistribute redistrib that spend within Australia and South Australia had its own market share of around 7% nationally, it's worth four and a half times more than international tourism. So targeting that domestic tourism is absolutely key and a huge opportunity. Number two is structure for change. The workforce structure has to be more adaptive and responsive as new challenges like COVID are thrown at your business. So uh, we've very much uh, restructured our business as we're rebuilding our workforce to be more adaptive and responsive. And then the third key learning for us and adapting our business moving forward is the importance of retaining key leaders. You can't respond and adapt your business accordingly unless you've got key leaders that have experience and have been through it 
um, and that can implement those changes because they've been part of that experience before with our business. So really key is retaining them to rebuild our workforce and to help protect our business moving forward. So they're key insights. In summary, uh, from a Majestic Hotels perspective, uh, through this COVID challenge and moving forward. Thanks so much for the opportunity and enjoy the conference. Pepsi? Yes. Good afternoon, good day, good evening, uh, greetings. This is Dr. Febz Okumus from UCF Rosen College of Hospitality Management. It, it is great to be part of this wonderful conference. Hopefully next time I can join you in person. Uh, our next question will be about uh, the, what is happening with the industry and what are the new required skills uh, and operational reality of the industry and how the industry can retain and further develop uh, talent. My good friend, Stephen Hood will answer from SDR. Uh, Steve, you're welcome. Hey, thank you, Fessy. Um, yeah, obviously we're a data company, so uh, we're gonna talk about analytic type skills. And, and, and I think that's, you know, that's as important as it's ever been. It's not a new talent, but it's certainly uh, uh, newly relevant. And, and understanding data, being able to look at the trends to make good strategic decisions, whether it's a tourism organization or a hotel company or uh, a consulting firm, a developer is, is critical now more than it ever has been. So, uh, you know, I think that that would be uh, one thing to stress. Thinking outside the box is, a, is another one. If you think about these hotels, uh, you know, a lot of hotels are having to reinvent themselves completely. And, and you know, if you're a meeting and event hotel, and, you know, that that's uh, you've got to be uh, dreaming up other things. All of a sudden you're thinking about weekend getaways and how do you capitalize on outdoor tourism and, and all kinds of different things. So um, uh, innovation and entrepreneurial uh, skills are critical as well. One of the things that's been really um, surprising to me during 2020, I, we, we do training mainly for universities, but we also do training for industry professionals. We figured the, the budgets for uh, industry professionals would just completely dry up in 2020. And we found the exact opposite. Uh, we, we've trained more industry professionals in 2020 than we ever have. And that's a great sign. You know, people realize the value of being able to understand the data and, and, and be able to figure their way out of the, the current situation. Thank you, Vezzi. Thank you very much. We now uh, move to and move and look at the attractions, events, and art culture industry. And Dennis Werder Magno, uh, Director of Cultural Development Center, George's Pompadeo, uh, will talk to us through a video about importance of virtual experiences, social distancing, private experiences, and new uh, operational realities. Thank you. We cannot hear anything. Sorry, but we can, I cannot hear anything. Can you hear? My apologies. The audio doesn't work, Claire. Okay. Perhaps we can move. We Mariana. can move. Uh, yeah, let's go to the next speaker until we solve the audio for that one. Uh, my honor to introduce you, Heather Kroll. She's actually the director of Adelaide uh, Fringe Festival here in Adelaide, which is one of the most iconic festivals, um, not just in South Australia and Australia, but probably worldwide. Um, the question is, how did the festival survive during the COVID? What type of innovations were introduced to uh, address the challenge? And what is the future plans? Heather.
we don't have Heather with us either. Uh, okay, let's move on so we don't waste time then. <laughs> I think it's my turn. Um, I will be asking questions to Paul Victory, General Manager of Growth and Innovation at the Sealing Travel Group. A couple of interesting questions. COVID has changed many things, and we are talking about sustainability and tourism. And what should uh, tourism suppliers do in terms of sustainability? And how can we establish credibility and trust in, in tourism in terms of sustainability? Thank you, yes, Paul. Great to be here. Um, if I could answer that question quickly, we'd all be millionaires. But um, we have a challenge, no doubt, as an industry. And the Sealink Travel Group is uh, a significant player here in Australia. We have uh, around 1,600 people dedicated to the travel and tourism industry. And uh, we have a range of activities right around Australia. However, we're significantly uh, affected by COVID, as many of us uh, in this uh, conference are. Our tourism businesses are around about 90% down. Our, 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 while our domestic recovery has um, uh, brought some good uh, uh, travel onto our uh, transport sector, our tourism, specific tourism business is, you know, is down 90%. Largely, that is uh, attached to the inbound industry, and I'll talk more about that. Yes, there's been some domestic uplift. However, domestic visitors spend far less on experiences than international visitors. Our declines include around 20,000 tours to Kangaroo Island, including our wonderful Kangaroo Island Odyssey program, which had been premium tourism product for the Italian honeymoon sector for more than a decade. Around 10,000 core Western market tours to the Barossa Valley and the Adelaide Hills on food and wine touring packages have all been lost. And a very large number of our cruise and dining packages, particularly for the China and Asia sector on Sydney Harbour have been lost. Will these tours come back? And I was very interested in Stephen's uh, research and, and Jackie's commentary. We'll talk more about that. Will these tours come back? Will, will we need to reposition our product and what new products may emerge? These are the key questions we as a company have been debating and, and formulating over the last few months as we look to reposition uh, in the recovery that uh, Stephen has just talked about, when that will come, I really don't know. It's hard for us to predict, but uh, because the environment keeps changing so rapidly, but certainly we are forecasting, as Stephen talked about, around later this uh, this uh, calendar year, 2021, and into 2022, and full recovery through 2023. At this stage, it is a bit early to predict. However, I certainly worry about the inbound tourism sector that has written much of the business into Australia for the last 20 years. And in fact, the inbound tourism industry in Australia dates back to around 1970. This part of the industry is in distress and uh, it is probably going to have the greatest impact. No doubt this part of the business, the travel distribution system is being disrupted as the modern traveler is much more aware, much more confident and more well-researched and I think Jackie's uh, touched on some of this in his research as well. More and more, the modern traveler will book independently and travel with purpose. And I want to explore this idea of traveling with purpose and what does that really mean for the industry and what can we do to prepare for this? Traveling with purpose is about traveling to seek experiences to explore destinations, to understand destinations more, to participate in, in, in projects and to learn more about my experience. It's not enough these days for destinations to offer and a sightseeing trip. There must be more depth in our, in our experiences. And this is something we're certainly looking for at Sealing. Post COVID-19, there'll be much more greater emphasis likely in the tourism sector 
for responsible travel initiative, initiatives, wildlife and environmentally balanced travel, active citizen science initiatives, approach of a full volunteerism and regenerative tourism where it's of regeneration that I enjoyed and to put as a true as a worldwide traveler today, I want to feel that my investment into a destination has been a wise investment and not and something done purposefully where I know it will matter to small communities in particular, regional communities and projects that I've talked about, things like responsible wildlife projects, citizen science projects, research-based projects, volunteerism-based projects. We have to ask ourselves as uh, commercial companies and destinations, is this a major or a minor sector of the tourism industry? And I wanted to share my experience over three sort of cases. One is on Kangaroo Island in South Australia. Sort of discussing this helps us look at uh, the defining shift in the industry. Kangaroo Island is one of the South Australia and one of Australia's nature tourism jewels. It's a key Australian tourism destination for brand Australia. It's often the wildlife destination people experience when they're coming to enjoy Australia. It's one of the highlights like Sydney Harbour, the Great Barrier Reef and Uluru. As Kangaroo Island regenerates post significant bushfires in 2020, it's already focused on developing more sustainable tourism experiences. Tours, attractions and experiences generally are looked at to be less about sightseeing and more about education, more about transformation and more about purpose. Spending time le learning about working with koalas at the Hanson Bay Sanctuary, joining a marine tour and contributing to dolphin research projects experiencing more of the seal and seal lion colonies with parks and wildlife who are doing a great job around our national parks in South Australia and understanding what happens post a major bushfire in a tourism destination. What has been the impact on our wildlife and our birds and our ecologies associated with the national parks? There's much more work to be done but there's a lot of work currently being done around the reinvention of Kangaroo Island post COVID-19. Post COVID and both the government and private sector are involved in this with both investment, time and effort. The second project I wanted to look at is a specific project called the Museum of Underwater Art in North Queensland. And it is an emerging brand Queensland Hallmark product. In fact, just this week, it has won a tourism award in China. At its recent launch, it attracted around about 184 million visitors through the digital space in its launch. This Museum of Underwater Art is an $8 million investment by governments in South Australia and the uh, governments across Australia and the corporate sector into an educational tourism and citizen science experience off of the coast of Townsville. The experience puts the, um, the project is an art installation in the Great Barrier Reef. The $8 million in Townsville responds to the impact of climate change and First Nation stories on Australia's Great Barrier Reef. And in particular, stories about the Great Barrier Reef means in 2020 and beyond. Since 2016, Townsville has been developing an underwater art experience with dive, snorkel, and intertidal sculptures that will provide an immersive, multi day new product in the region. It has already been globally recognized. And the third uh, case study if like, is, is some work 
being currently undertaken by tourism Queensland, the state government of Queensland, Australia, industry industry to support for industry for tourism industry partners to make the shift a strategic push into the travel for good sector and the travel for good theme has become one of the major strategic approaches of the queensland government throughout 2021 and 2022 queensland's tourism industry are encouraged to develop their core messaging and experience around stronger values that support the travel for good message again um, contributing to the idea that the tourism industry is moving forward from sightseeing and into a more stronger value proposition. The final question is how big is this sector? Is it really worthwhile moving into this sector? What is the major and minor sector? Is this a major or a minor sector of the tourism industry? And as a commercial player, I need to understand this about how much effort do we put into this? And my reasoning is yes, it will be substantial. And I think you see that this, you see the, the touch of that on both Stephen and Jackie's statistics around what is the popular products that people are going to be looking for going forward. And I think one of the major things was natural landscapes and outdoor based travel. It will expand to be a major part of the worldwide travel industry. The world traveler is not only travel aware, but is educated on responsible destinations, tours and experiences. Over time, destinations that will have a strong value set and that are supported by substantial and sustainable experiences will expand. No doubt food, wine and events will continue to drive experiences. However, travel with purpose, travel for good is a new emerging and surprisingly large sector of the travel market that Australian products cannot ignore. Thank you, Devsen. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, that was a very great insight and very encouraging for us as academics because uh, many things that we have heard from keynote speakers and workshops is about this transformational uh, potential uh, and economy that hopefully COVID has accelerated. Good to see that the industry is responding, uh, is watching the trends and hopefully something will be done. Now to catch up with time, uh, we have one more sector to look at in terms of what is going on. And this is the sector of the travel or tourism intermediaries. It is our honor to have with us, Brett Jardine, who is the managing director of the Council of Australia Tour Operators to talk to us about how he sees the future of the sector and what are the challenges to come. And we also have Melissa Laurie from TripAdvisor. I don't think I need to introduce TripAdvisor more to everyone. Um, and I would like Melissa to share with us what insights or data TripAdvisor has, because it's a major source of travel intelligence in terms of what are the major travel trends that you see are happening or people are inquiring globally? And if there are any similarities or differences that we can see among countries? Uh, let's start with Brad and then Melissa can follow. Thank you. Thanks, Mariana. I think um, moving forward, you know, the, the value of intermediaries uh, is highlighted as even more important than, than what it has been in the past. You know, when, when we see Australians travelling overseas uh, in times of crisis, whether it be a local event such as a terrorist attack or as we're experiencing now a global pandemic, you know, our government's default position is talk to your local tour operator for the support. Uh, as this pandemic continues and puts more financial stress on uh, travel intermediaries, uh, we're seeing more of them start to fall by the wayside. That will quite simply put more pressure on, on government to support Australians when travelling overseas. So for me, uh, a, a greater level of understanding of this position and support of the sector is absolutely critical. So we get through this, uh, through this COVID mess that we're currently experiencing.
Ariana? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry, my microphone was off. Melissa, what is your view? Yeah, sure. I um I will actually have a few slides that I'll share just to give you um, an insight into what we are seeing at TripAdvisor. So I might just share screen. Give me one. One moment, please. I might just check that you can see my screen. Yes. Um, just checking. Is it on the um, full preview? Yes. Yeah, excellent. Great. Um, <clears throat> Looks nice. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so just in short, um, TripAdvisor, we're a global company. I'm based in Melbourne and my role is I work with different businesses and help rec recommend marketing solutions that they can rep implement on TripAdvisor. Um, last year, we celebrated 20 years in the landscape and it's been a very interesting year and I really just wanted to give a little bit of colour into some of the trends that we're seeing, which is a mixture of our own data and then we've also been running consumer research surveys globally in key markets. Um, so in short, we've seen a really big shift to domestic browsing, given that borders are closed and um, are many, in many regions around the world. So from a split of um, people engaging with domestic content, which was 58% at the start of the year, it's now shifted to about 90%. There's still a lot of uncertainty that we're seeing in the market. And this is reflected with some of the domestic hotel average stay durations that we're seeing, which is approximately one to two nights. In terms of just some of the um, key trends that we're seeing for people just across the board, it has been non-price factors. So what do I mean by this? Well, when we've surveyed consumers most recently, they have spoken highly about avoiding crowded places. People are nervous to be around big crowds. Um, so for example, I worked across Disneyland and there's been a big focus on how they can ensure that they limit crowds, that people are wearing masks and so forth. Also cancellation and booking policies. I'm sure that a lot of us have been um, exposed to borders closing um, and if we've had to change travel plans as well. So now more than ever, this is really important. And also safety and cleanliness of establishments as well. There's a lot of questions that we are seeing pop up about what does it look like the next time I fly? What like, do I need to get there um, you know, quite a few hours earlier because I need to do these um, safety pro uh, pro procedures? So these are the key trends that we have seen across the board globally. Um, in terms of just how we've responded as a business, we've, and I'm sure that there's other um, platforms that have also done um, uh, similar on their platforms to help business owners, but given the heightened uncertainty for many different people, we've updated the platform so that businesses can actually update their COVID safety features on TripAdvisor, which is completely free. So this not only extends with updating details online, but also having those details updated within your business as well. So it's very clear. So as an example, I know cafes near me, we have, um, I'm in Melbourne, so there's a lot of floor markings in the cafes where you have to stand. Um, a lot of employees are still in masks. There's hand, sanitize, hand sanitization stations as well. So again, this trend of health and safety is really critical for businesses to ensure that they are really clear in what they're um, taking in their business. And again, this is just a way that um, businesses um, can update their details and then how people can actually search for the details on TripAdvisor as well. I might just pause there and give, um, stop sharing screen, Mariana. So thank you, Melissa. And um, 
Mariana, Dennis's yeah. video, they say there is ready. If you, if, if we have time, we can play that. If it's yes, okay. yes. And I see Heather Kroll has managed to uh, log in and solve all technical issues. Heather, can you hear us? No? Hello, yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Uh, what would you like to share with us in terms of how Adelaide Friends has innovated to address the COVID issues uh, during the last year and for the years to come? Yeah, thank you so much. And hello, everybody. Um, uh, I, um, well, Adelaide Fringe um, has, you know, obviously, like everyone else, we've had a the last 10 months of just um, adapting, um, spinning around, putting scenarios in place and, and being willing to put options of our plans because obviously normally with an event, you, you like to have a, a, a timeline and you like to have deadlines um, setting to, setting along, along the way, ticking off milestones. It's not really the way planning's working at the moment. So we've implemented a much more agile approach. We do lots of circular planning that is open to continuous improvement, um, listening. We listen to, I mean, we're really guided by the health um, regulations. That is absolutely paramount. So uh, making sure that everyone's um, safe is um, totally a priority. And so all our plans must fit within the guidelines of uh, in our in our case, it's SA Health. Um, normally, fringe sell. Um, we normally sell around about eight hundred thousand tickets a year in our festival, and it means we uh, over a month we we often sell about thirty thousand tickets every single day. Um, so, as you can imagine, the crowd densities are high. Uh, so, what we've been looking at is making sure that the fringe program is very decentralised across hundreds and hundreds of venues, um, which we've succeeded in um, embracing venues in the suburbs, in the regions. Um, and we, we do have a, um, a program on sale right now, and it's um, around about 900 shows. But um, the, the way the venues um, will be rolling out will be very different. So capacity is reduced. Capacity is around about 50%. Um, we have very different um, social distancing rules implemented around um, the queuing, around how people check in. Um, so a lot, of, um, a lot of the planning has been around those kind of uh, making sure that everyone can still function, but within the COVID safe environment. Um, we've um, seen incredible uptake the artists and the venues um, have been incredibly resilient and willing to um, work within those rules uh, many of the artists who uh, perform in the fringe we have about 6,000 artists in our festival um, a lot of them haven't performed since Adelaide Fringe 2020 because Adelaide Fringe ended um, March 18th, 2020, and restrictions were introduced on March 19th. So the last day of Adelaide Fringe was almost the last day most people performed. So they're very desperate to get back on stage. And um, and even though the capacity rules are there, they are willing to work within those capacity rules. We've, so far, our ticket sales, we've... Um, We've actually already sold 100,000 tickets, which is what, much higher than we thought we would be on this day. We thought we might have maybe sold 50,000, but the audience appetite is huge and the audience appetite is um, showing that um, as long as people feel that the, that the rules are being adhered to, that they will deliver um, that they will attend, that they will sell, that they will buy tickets. So, um, you know, we, as I said, we normally sell 800,000 tickets. Um, if we sell 600,000 tickets, we, we're, I mean, we'll be gobsmacked, but it does, we look like we're on track to sell around nice. 600,000 tickets. So, you know, I think it's about being safe, but it's about delivering within the rules. Good to hear that uh, the demand is resilient apart from the industry. 
Um, I see we have about 12 minutes left and I would like to open the uh, floor to our audience. Uh, thanks again for all of you for sharing your insights. We're really privileged to hear insights from you who are actually leaders in our um, sector as well. I will be monitoring the Events Air platform for questions and Fevzi, if you can monitor the Zoom chat, uh, then we could uh, try to uh, sure. be able to satisfy most of the people who would like to ask our distinguished panel. Mary, uh, also, if we have time, I... Dennis can, my apologies, we can play Dennis's video uh, if we have time. Uh, Yes, um, I thought of that, but I uh, thought of opening the floor as well. Okay. Uh, just to make it more interactive and we can play the video at the end uh, if we have time. Sure. Any questions? I don't see any questions yet I from the chat function. Mariana, Let's play the if, if, yes. if I may, can I just add a little bit more to, uh, to what we were uh, focused on as part of my session? By all means, yes. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. I, my, my mistake. I, I was uh, answering your initial question and I, and I wasn't uh, quite ready to jump into our, our full spiel, but I'll keep it very short. But just, to, just by way of information, so as uh, we have some perspective on the whole travel and tourism space. Um, so who I represent as the Council of Australian Tour Operators is uh, the organisations that, that really sit behind retail travel agents, uh, that organisations that take the risk to invest in, develop, uh, package and distribute product that's, that's sold to consumers. So effectively we're the, the manufacturing side of the, the travel industry known as tour operators and wholesalers. Now, if we quickly look at pre-COVID uh, some industry facts. 11 million Australians travelled overseas in 2019 and six and a half million of these were for leisure or holidays. Um, the average spend of these Australians was $8,000 uh, based on our research with our members, which means more than $52 billion was spent on leisure travel, uh, outbound, international. So what's forgotten amongst this is that around 20 billion of that actually stays in Australia as an economic impact, uh, despite the fact that we're very focused on outbound travel. Also, our members are very heavily invested in domestic holidays that have a significant uh, positive impact on, or positive economic impact on regional Australia. So uh, very important for, for everyone involved to understand that um, outbound travel totally underpins aviation into and out of Australia and t is totally complementary to inbound tourism, uh, which is critical for, for all of us here in Australia. Um, also, just um, a few things in, in, in looking at where we're at moving forward. Uh, a lot of Australians have been forced uh, under Australian consumer law to accept a credit for future travel. Um, it is our sector the tour operators and wholesalers that actually have the visibility and the knowledge of where all of these credits sit, not just here in Australia, but all over the world. Uh, something that's critical uh, for Australian consumers to be certain that they're not gonna lose literally billions of dollars worth of, worth of travel credits that are currently on file. Now, the, the global travel ecosystem is a very complex web of distribution from travel agents for tour operators and wholesalers uh, through the destination management companies and suppliers all over the world. Um, absolutely critical that we all understand that inbound and outbound tourism from every one of the 195 countries around the world has to continue to flow and we all need to support it. And consumer education around this is, is absolutely critical. Uh, and I'd also just, I guess in, in closing, talk about consumer confidence. We have to have a national approach around state borders. You know, the current political posturing by our state premiers is, is not helpful. And when we look forward to our prime minister engaging with other countries to discuss outbound tourism from Australia into their countries, but also inbound uh, tourism into Australia, how can the prime minister confidently negotiate on our behalf for all of our benefit when we have state premiers uh, 
posturing the way they are at, 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 uh, at the drop of a hat and closing borders. We need to have a consistent national approach. Mm -hmm. um, and Thank in closing, you know, uh, I'll just say that um, the extension of JobKeeper for our industry is, is absolutely critical, but may not be the complete saviour that we all think it's going to be. JobKeeper is a wage supplement. It's, it's simply a in and out for a business, doesn't actually support business owners and doesn't actually completely cover the cost of business owners retaining staff. Thank you. There is actually a question for you. Um, Mariana, we have two questions. Yeah, the first question is for Brad. Um, to what extent you, your members have adapted to the reality um, mm -hmm. focusing more on domestic travel? Very difficult. It's um, outbound, it's not feasible. Yeah. Good question, thank you, David. Very difficult because at the end of the day, Australians by and large have undertaken domestic travel uh, of their own, on their own accord through the, the advent of the internet over the last two decades. And most will easily book their own airfares, lock into uh, local accommodation uh, and make their own arrangements once they get there. Um, what is has, has worked for some of our members is where we have been able to package unique um, destinations in and around Australia with some unique product offerings. Um, places where, you know, particularly in regional areas where we wouldn't normally consider traveling to. So this, I guess the upside of COVID where we can't travel internationally has given us the opportunity to potentially experience uh, new destinations in and around Australia. Um, and a couple of prime examples that come to mind for me areas in your backyard in South Australia, like the Air Peninsula, areas in the Northern Territory, such as East Arnhem Land, and exploring beyond these places, uh, as opposed to your, your typical capital city stay, uh, and, and really starting to under, uncover uh, some very special uh, experiences that actually exist in our own backyard, but not easy. And of course, a lot of our members are actually destination specialists in their own right. So if you're a destination specialist, for Africa or South America or Europe, it's very difficult to then all of a sudden turn around and become a destination specialist mm -hmm. for domestic holidays in what is already a very crowded market uh, and competing with, you know, inbound tour operators and local suppliers that already do, a, do an exceptional job in delivering what we have to offer here. Particularly when you have a brain drain as well. <laughs> like the challenge is high, I imagine. Um, Heather, a question for you, a quite easy or quick one. To what extent Adelaide Fringe has received any assistance from the SA government to adapt with the safety and health uh, requirements? Uh, yeah, so we've actually, um, thank you. Um, we've had assistance from the SA government, but we've also had federal, we, our application for RISE funding was successful. And what we did with all that money is we, Adelaide Fringe, kept um, zero dollars of it. And we've already handed all that money out and paid it out in grants to all the, sh all the artists and the venues because... Um, they're the ones who are really exposed and taking so much risk. I mean, we're exposed and taking risk as well, but without us giving them some sort of um, grants from the funding we received, um, they literally wouldn't have been able to get over the line and put on their shows and have their venues ready. So we've actually... Um, We've actually paid all, um, all our rise money and state money out to the to the venues and the artists now, so which nice. has been a game changer for them. Yeah, I'm watching the clock. We have about six minutes left, uh, and if I may, uh, because the majority of our audience comes from the academia, universities, and research centres. If there is one thing that probably COVID has changed in terms of how university and researchers should engage with industry, what is this new thing that we need to consider? And what would you expect from us, the academics, to help you? Um, just one thing, um, if you can share your ideas and we can start with Jackie, who hasn't spoken for a while. Hey, thank you, Mariana. Um, I think, yeah, more collaboration on the um, um, 
research front uh, will be definitely uh, one thing. And if I might add one, maybe source of talent. Yeah, we, we are very eager to have uh, great talents to join. Yeah. Thank you. Stephen. Um, I'm going to echo that, Jackie. Uh, collaborative, I think, you know, what we're seeing right now is a real opportunity for collaborative research. I know, you know, we work closely with all of all the hotel brands in the world. You know, some of their, uh, you know, the, the strategic department, strategic intelligence departments, the research departments, they've been hard hit. And uh, so these hotel uh, companies, the ones that are left, you know, really could benefit from academia coming aside and coming you know, side by side with them and saying, hey, what can we do together? You know, it's challenging because, you know, uh, research agendas are different. Fev's the, uh, you know, uh, just petted from Hilton. He wants an answer in two weeks. Uh, Fev's the, uh, wants an answer in two years, you know, so it's a different type of thing. But I think there's an opportunity. Uh, we're work, you know, we do a lot with research roundtables around the world. We have them scheduled for the spring because we think there's a real opportunity for uh, industry and academia to work together like they haven't before. What about Melissa? I agree with collaboration and even just to take it one step further, just from a business perspective, thinking about how businesses in this time can work together and collaborate on different ideas. So um, it has been a really tough year last year for tourism businesses. Um, and so suggestions include just partnering with different businesses to be stronger together. So an example that I've seen where I um, live is wineries. We're working with restaurants in the city to form a partnership so that they can put on special events. Um, so thinking about how we can all be creative and support one another. I know that there's a lot of um, research out there in the marketplace as well, and it can be overwhelming. So I think also just like test and learn um, and and see what the appetite is in the market as well will be another recommendation too. Paul, can you share something in less than 20 seconds? <laughs> no pressure. There's, uh, I mean, I support collaboration. Um, active field work is another great way. And why not just have university kids out enjoying experiences? So actually doing practical field work practical research projects, working within organisations. Uh, great, great, great thing. Brilliant. Yeah, so I think also are, just um, one, thing, one thing about the collaboration that I think as well is that um, also seeing it um, as a deeper collaboration in the co-design way, which is a slightly uh, deeper way to collaborate, allowing things to emerge that you might not, really be expecting um, so you don't already know what you're aiming for in that process and allowing there to be a little bit more agility in not just um, collaboration on a thing that you then release but to actually have things in a live data uh, way released and improved and built on that that would be a really great thing I think to see co-design as well as collaboration. We are going to be cut off so Thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.